Actually, what's going on up here is not gastric emptying. The gastric emptying here is controlled by the hormones from the duodenum. The CCK will keep this tight and it will actually want to decrease the activity up here in the stomach. It will, as CCK levels go down, then more secretions of chlorophyll, more hydrochloric acid is put out, more digestion occurs, more motility occurs. As peristaltic waves push the food against the pyloric sphincter, which is now less tight because CCK levels are going down, then food can go into the duodenum. But then when it enters the duodenum, CCK levels go back up and this tightens, and this quiets down again. That's why if you eat an average meal, it takes about three hours for the food to clear out of your stomach. It um, takes little bits at a time, so it doesn't overwhelm the digestive processes of the duodenum, and then that doesn't um, overwhelm the reabsorptive capabilities of the jejunum. So peristaltic contractions actually for mixing and turning and mechanically breaking down the things that can't be digested. Your book, your textbook says that amylase is still active in the stomach. I seriously doubt that because amylase, salivary amylase has a very high pH optimum, it's like 6.8 to 7. And when it hits the acid in the stomach, it's not going to be active. But the lingual lipase and the pepsin, those are, and the gastric lipase, those will be active. So fats and proteins will be digested, but not your amylase. I really doubt that it's going to, it might have some hidden pockets where it can continue to be active, but not very much. So when you are when this is tight, then any waves of contraction that do occur is more for the mixing and churning and mechanical breakdown. The fundus lies above the esophageal opening and usually contains gas rather than food. The rate of peristaltic contractions in the stomach is governed by pacesetter cells in the greater curvature of the fundus. The smooth muscle layers of the fundus are relatively thin and produce only weak contractions. The middle part of the stomach is the body. Because the muscle layers of the body are thin, peristaltic contractions in this region are weak. Food emptied from the esophagus is stored in the body without being mixed. The lowest part of the stomach is the thickly muscled antrum. Strong antral peristaltic contractions mix food with gastric secretions and provide the driving force for gastric emptying. Pacesetter cells in the fundus generate slow wave potentials that initiate peristaltic waves. In the thinly muscled fundus and body, these peristaltic contractions are weak. When waves reach the antrum, where the muscle is thicker, they become much stronger. Peristaltic contraction forces food toward the pyloric sphincter and a small volume is pushed through into the small intestine. Before more stomach contents can be squeezed out, the peristaltic wave reaches the pyloric sphincter causing it to contract. The contents that were being forced forward are tumbled back into the antrum. This tossing back and forth of food with the gastric secretions produces a mixture known as chyme. 
The amount of chyme that enters the duodenum with each peristaltic wave depends on the strength of peristalsis. Gastric levels are going up, hydrochloric acid levels are going up, 
more digestion is occurring, you get more liquidity of your stomach contents, it can then be ready to go into the duodenum. CCK levels have gone down, pyloric sphincter has relaxed a little bit, press on the upstream side of the pyloric sphincter, and goes into the duodenum. So what is stimulating CCK release? and also cholesis, um, the secretin release, the presence of fat, presence of acid, anything that is increasing the particulate concentration. It could be an unabsorbable particle that you just put into the intestine. It still gets CCK and secretin release. So hypertonicity, you put a balloon in there, you could also get CCK and secretin release. So any distension, any change in osmolarity, but mostly the presence of amino acids and fat, right? And also carbohydrate will get the secretin and cholecystokinin release. Cholecystokinin, the cholecard tells you it's involved with bile. And the cystokinin is referring, the, the cyst part is referring to the gallbladder. This is going to be responding to the presence of fats and amino acids. And fats usually come with the proteins. So plant proteins, animal proteins, they'll have fat along with them. So a combination of stimulations for the release of cholecystokinin. When you're digesting proteins, you get a more acid solution, but also the stomach contents arrive very acidic. So that presence of acid in the duodenum is going to cause secretin levels to go up. And secretin will then cause the pancreas to release bicarb into the duodenum. As CCK levels go up, then you're going to inhibit the gastric motility and emptying until the duodenum has digested the material and is ready to pass on to the duodenum for absorption. So this is the key to the control, is what is the duodenum ready for? Is it ready to pass things on, or is it still in the process of digestion? If it's still digesting, then it quiets the stomach down. If it's ready to pass it on, then it will decrease CCK levels as the food goes on to the duodenum, and then gastric motility and secretions increase, and you get more food coming into the duodenum. Outside the digestive system, if you are emotions, you can be depressed and that you think that that would, um, a depression would cause a decrease in motility and oftentimes it does, it causes people to get constipated and not digest things very well not feel like eating at all because it slows down motility and emptying of the whole way. But some people respond differently. And high anxiety, you might think that that would stimulate everything, but then it usually does. And most people, when they get anxious, everything starts to go a little bit faster through the GI system. But if you get too anxious, then you get more of a sympathetic nervous system response and you get just the opposite. You shut down the GI system and you tend to get more constipated. Intense pain do really does tend to stop the motility and the emptying. Um, really intense pain you might get a complete evacuation of the bowels and just total losing every um, the bowel continents and probably also your bladder continents. But the, the pain lasting beyond that, then everything is um, slowed down. Okay, so duodenums, if there's fat there, 
going to slow everything down, slow the emptying. Acid is going to slow the emptying. So fat is going to cause cholecystokine concentrations to increase. Acid, secretin is going to increase. Both of them are going to slow down secretions in the stomach, motility in the stomach, and therefore emptying of the stomach. And even, uh, as I said, you could put in particles, some glass beads or polystyrene beads, and they can, if they increase the osmolarity in the duodenum, then it's just as though you had the presence of fat or amino acids or carbohydrate there. It slows everything down. And a balloon will also do that as well. CCK is a hormone. We're going to come back and talk about its effects on the brain. So it is having effects on the stomach. It's having effects on the pancreatic secretion. And it's also going to have effects on your brain and your desire to continue to eat. So it's a, a multifunctional secretion. Good table for you to look at, at things and summarize what's going on. The exocrine secretions, these are your exocrine secretion cells. Your mucus is there for protection. And so is the bicarb that is secreted by cells in the mucosa. That is going to create a pH at the surface of your stomach of 7. Whereas the contents of the stomach will be at pH 2 or 1. The surface of the stomach, the gastric lining, will be protected by mucus and bicarb that will be at a neutral pH. So the cells will be happy, they will not be digested, but the contents of your stomach will be digested. So protecting against the digestion of your stomach by the things that are being released by the glandular cells in the stomach to digest your food products. Cheek cells secrete the inactive pepsinogen, but when it comes in contact with the hydrochloric acid from the prior cells, it becomes pepsin, which then can digest any protein, not just the exogenous protein from your body, but also dead and dying cells from your gastric lining, any protein that might spill out into the gastric system from inside your body, that also will be digested by the pepsin and later on by proteases in the small intestine. What stimulates the release of pepsinogen is gastrin, which is also going to stimulate the release of hydrochloric acid, and then your autonomic nervous system, your parasympathetic release of acetylcholine and binding to muscarinic receptors will stimulate chief cells to release pepsinogen and parietal cells to release hydrochloric acid and also along with the intrinsic factor. The Histamine is involved because we have some cells that are in the neighborhood. And I put I posted a figure for you, and that includes these ECL cells that are called in, um, enterochromaffin-like cells, meaning they pick up stain a lot, but they're in your lining of your stomach. These cells release histamine. Gastrin stimulates the ECL cells to release histamine. Histamine binds to the parietal cell and stimulates acid secretion. Gastrin binding to the parietal cell stimulates gastric secretion. ACH binding to the parietal cells stimulates gastric secretion. We've got three ways to increase gastric secretion. Now we've got a couple ways to well, I've got a lot of ways also to turn it off. But from the receptor side, we'll have uh, somatostatin, 
will have a prostaglandin that can turn it off uh, and then decreases in those will turn it off. Okay, so what is the importance of the hydrochloric acid? It's activating the carcinogen. What that means is it's chopping part of the part of the molecule off to leave you with the active protease pepsin. The hydrochloric acid will activate the pepsin, which can actually break the peptide bonds down in the protein by hydrolysis. But it also, the contact of the acid on the proteins intact denature the proteins. We learned about that last semester. If you add lemon juice to protein, it denatures the protein. It unwinds the protein. Unwinding the protein allows for better access for the proteases to the peptide bonds. So it's actually helping with the digestion by denaturing the proteins. Also breaks down the proteins of the connective tissue. The collagens are proteins. They have a conformation that's going to be denatured by the hydrochloric acid as well. And then they can be digested. And then the acid also kills most microorganisms. But we have a whole battery of about 500 different kinds of bacteria that live in our colon, and the way they get there is through our gastrointestinal tract. We take them in in our mouth, they survive the stomach, the motility of the small intestine is pretty high, so most of the bacteria just get pushed into the slower moving colon, and that's where they take up residence. So really the, the small intestine is relatively sterile, the helium a little bit more bacteria because it's closest to the colon, but duodenum, jejunum, the movement of the substance, they think, because it goes pretty quickly through those lengths that the bacteria just get swept on out. But they are constantly arriving at our mouth, and then most of them get fried in the acid, and then only the ones that can survive that can take up residence in our large intestine. Importance of intrinsic factor is for vitamin B12 absorption, and that is for the red blood cell production. Endocrine and paracrine cells. So here we've got, I'm going to just skip to the G cells, because that, I already told you, secretes gastrin. When we saw the gastric gland, I pointed out the G cell. This is going to release gastrin, and then gastrin is going to stimulate the parietal cells and also chief cells to release the pepsinogen. The gastrin also stimulates the enteropromethin like cells, these ECL cells, which release the histamine. And then histamine uh, will also be released by the binding of acetylcholine to the receptors on the cell. So gastrin directly stimulates parietal cells, indirectly causes histamine to come out, which then causes the stimulation of the parietal cells. And then acetylcholine from the parasympathetic nerves will stimulate the release of hydrochloric acid. And then any protein products in the stomach, presence of proteins, peptides, or amino acids, will, will stimulate the release of gastrin. The gastrin also has a trophic effect for the lining of the stomach. That means you get an increase in the rate of mitosis of the stomach lining cells so that the cells that are sloughing off are replaced by new cells. And you replace your whole stomach lining about every two to three days. That's a huge turnover of cells. 
And all those cells, where do they go? They come out in your feces. And most of your feces actually is dead cells. It's not what you ate the day before. It's the dead and the dead cells and the sloughed off um, cells from your stomach lining, from your gastrointestinal lining. Huge rate of turnover of those cells. D cells also present release somatostatin. And somatostatin we learned about last semester, it stops secretion of things in that area. So presence of an increase in acid in the stomach means you've got enough acid, let's slow down these parietal cells. So it's a negative feedback effect. The presence of acid stimulates the D cell to release the somatostatin, which then inhibits the parietal cell. It also inhibits G cells and ECL cells. So everything that is stimulating the parietal cells gets decreased. And then hydrochloric acid levels go down until you need more. And then when there's a decrease in stomach um, acid, then there's a decrease in somatostatin, which means all these other things then have the control again. Gastrin, histamine, the acetylcholine, um, they're all going to then get the parietal cells to start to secrete acid again. So we've got our gastric pit here, and then gastric gland down here. The gland is where you have your parietal cells. Those are the dark cells. The T cells are down here. Your G cells are down here. They are all, and then your enterochromaffin cells are down there. The nerves are coming up from the plexuses and the submucosa and your myenteric plexus, and they're releasing the acetylcholine. So we've got G cells, histamine secreting ECL cells, we've got the autonomic nervous system all stimulating, and then we have D cells that will turn off the secretions when they're adequate. So the contents of the stomach, presence of protein, or parts of proteins like peptides and amino acids, distension of the stomach will cause an increase in secretion. And then when there's adequate acid out here, that will then stimulate the D cells to release somatostatin, which will turn off the glands. And then as if stomach pH goes back up, then that will turn off the D cell and the glands will start to secrete again. So here is a parietal cell. We've got not very much information on this cell, so we'll, I gave you another cell to look at, but to start with, let's look at this. We've got a uh, cell so that wants to get hydrochloric acid out into the gastric lumen. And it's going to do that with active transport. And we've got these active transporters that are downregulated in the parietal cell when there is no stimulation of the parietal cell. And then once there is stimulation on this side, then there's going to be uh, upregulation of those transporters into the parietal cell membrane. Hydrogen ions are pumped out in exchange for potassium. We get the potassium from the lumen because the potassium leaks out its regular weak channels. The chloride will passively follow because of the positive charge that's going out there in the form of a proton, you'll get chloride following. And then you'll have the appropriate enzyme 
out there that will stick the hydrogen and the chloride together to form hydrochloric acid. Carbonic anhydrase is involved in here again because it's the source of the hydrogen ion. You don't have the hydrogen until CO2 diffuses in, gets converted to bicarb and hydrogen ion. The hydrogen is pumped out and the bicarb is exchanged in um, exchange for chloride. So chloride is brought in uh, to the cell so it can then diffuse out the other side. So that's a short introduction to where the hydrogen ions come from. They're the enzymes out here that are going to stick the hydrogen and the chloride together to make HCl. Pepsin secreting chief cells are secreting the pepsin. Those will, the hydrochloric acid and the pepsin probably will come in contact with each other before they even get out of the gastric pit. So it will be HCl by the time you get out there. And this will be pepsin by the time you get out into the stomach contents. So pepsinogen is converted to pepsin by HCl and actually part of the molecule chopped off. Pepsin is going to then attack the peptide bonds of the proteins and the peptides that are out there. Hydrochloric acid will denature the protein, so it will start to unwind so that there's more surface area accessible for the peptide bonds for the pepsin to act on. The ACL gives you the optimum pH for the pepsin, which is pH 2 or lower, and well, maybe up to pH 3 or so. Peptide fragments are then delivered to the duodenum for further digestion. So pepsin does not get you too many free amino acids for absorption. The finishing of the digestion of the protein will occur in the duodenum. And then just to remind you, the connective tissue, the collagen, which is a protein, also denatured by HCL and also digested by the pepsin um, and kills your microorganisms. And because you're, you're protecting the stomach by the mucus and the bicarb that are attached together, but still the surface epithelium is swept off and replaced every about three days, two to three days, you get a complete relining of the stomach. To start digestion, you have cephalic phase where you see food, think of food, smell food, food send the action potentials out via the vagus nerve that starts the stomach secretions. The gastric phase is when the food is actually present in the stomach. You have proteins and fats there or you have pressure there in the stomach that will cause the release of the chemicals that start protein digestion. And then you have intestinal phase where you have the enzymes from the pancreas that are finishing the digestion of the food. So we've got three phases of digestion. You pre-set your gastrointestinal system when you see food, smell food, or think of food. Secretions already start, some gastric motility already starts. And then when the food arrives in the stomach, you get a heightening of the response and a finishing, even more so heightened response in the duodenum when the pancreatic enzymes and bile get involved. This is a good flow chart to look at, kind of small, maybe for a presentation here. Cephalic phase, everything's handled by the vagus nerve. Vagus nerve is going to directly stimulate 
the gastrin cells, gastrin secreting cells. It also is going to stimulate the enteric nervous system. And the enteric nervous system will release acetylcholine. G cells stimulate the parietal cells by release of gastrin. The ACH stimulates the parietal cells and then also stimulates the G cells. Gastrin diffuses to the parietal cells, but it diffuses next door to the entero enterochromatin-like cells, ECL cells. They release histamine, and then histamine goes back to the parietal cells and stimulates the parietal cells. So you've got acetylcholine, you've got gastrin, and you've got histamine, increasing the secretion of the parietal and also chief cells. So we've got HDL going out, we've got pepsinogen going out, they mix together, and then we've got pepsin and HDL in the gastric lumen. In the gastric phase, then food arrives. Food present in the stomach um, will stimulate the uh, vagus nerves in the area. And then they will stimulate the intrinsic nerves, just as they did with the cephalic phase. And as the choline levels go up and do the same thing that they did with the cephalic phase, stimulate chief and parietal cells. The G cells are releasing gastrin, which stimulates the ECL cells, and histamine levels go up. So more of what happened with the cephalic phase is now present. And also the peptide fragments, protein in the stomach, the distension, caffeine and alcohol also will stimulate G cells to secrete the gastrin and then get more histamine and more activation of G cells and parietal cells. The inhibition of gastric secretion, we've got, if, you, if the protein contents are gone, they've gone, throw them up, but also if you have them passed on to the duodenum already, if they're not there, if distension is decreased because you threw up or you passed them on to the duodenum, then you have a inhibition of the vagus and inhibition then a decreased stimulation of the intrinsic nerves via the vagus but also a direct decrease in um, stimulation of the intrinsic nerves you have a decrease in g cells both via these nerves not stimulating the g cells but also a direct decrease in the stimulation of G cells by the distension. So if gastrin levels go down, they, that doesn't stimulate the parietal cells. Gastrin doesn't stimulate the ECL cells, histamine goes down, no stimulation of the parietal cells. So ACL <coughs> secretions go down, pepsinogen secretions go down, ACL and pepsin content in the stomach lumen if acid goes up, cover that already. When there's high levels of acid in the stomach, stimulates the D cells to release somatostatin, another way to turn off the parietal cells via the hormone somatostatin. So somatostatin is going to turn off parietal cells directly turn off G cells, turn off ECL cells. So metastatin stops secretion of all secretory cells. So it's, it decreases secretions from parietal cells, decreases gastrin release from G cells, decreases histamine release from ECL cells. Three powerful ways to turn off HCL secretion. The intestinal phase, when the intestine is full of protein, fat, carbohydrate, 
then it's going to, or just hypertonicity, it's going to stimulate the enterogastric reflex. So now we've got the enteric nervous system feeding back to the stomach, decreasing those peristaltic waves. So the peristaltic waves aren't pushing contents against the pyloric sphincter. We've also got the duodenum releasing cholecystokinin and secretion, um, secretin, which are going to decrease the HCL production and decrease gastrin release and therefore decrease the ability to digest the contents of the stomach. And now you've got motility decrease, digestion decrease, no reason for anything to go across to the small intestine. So CCK levels and secretin decrease, you won't have further digestion going on. You've got a tight pyloric sphincter. We have also when the, the distension goes away in the duodenum, then this reflex will turn off and you get an increase in the peristalsis again. So duodenum is, again, powerfully in control of what comes to it. So this slide I stuck in is not in your PowerPoint, but it's in your textbook. So I'm not putting anything that's not in your textbook unless I posted it separately and let you know about it. So the stair cells in the gastric lining of the pit, the, the reprieta cell probably doesn't read, it's down in the gland, but not up in the pit. And we're, we're going to be protecting, even in the gland, for the digestion of the surface of the cells. But primarily, it's going to be up in the pit area and then the, the lining of the main lumen of the stomach, where we're going to have a lot of this bicarb and mucus um, secretion. So it's going to keep a pH of 7 right on the surface of the cells, even though the pH in the stomach and the, the pits and the glands may be at 2 or lower. They're going, the cells aren't going to be digested, and the proteins on the cells won't be denatured by the hydrochloric acid and the pepsin. So this is a figure I put together for myself to try and put all this information together to be able to see visually. It's very complicated, yeah, and I actually added some things since I posted it to you based on what, was, what I discovered being talked about in Sherwood. But We've got our big parietal cell, and we've got these tubular vesicular structures. What are they? They're the proton pumps. So they're down-regulated when the parietal cell is not stimulated. Why have them in the luminal surface if they're not doing anything? So take them out, store them, and then when there's a, a stimulation of the parietal cell, insert them back into the membrane, and then they can pump hydrogen in exchange for the potassium. So how do they get upregulated? You have to get an active protein kinase to move them into the plasma membrane. So how do you activate your protein kinase? You got to remember back to your endocrine system. One way is cyclic AMP. And we have cells, we have, sorry, receptors in the membrane that activate the G-linked protein and upregulate the adenylocyclase, the cyclic AMP concentration. That's the H2 receptor. H2 is for histamine. So 
histamine, that's the H, and subgroup 2. So these G protein linked receptors activate adenylocyclase, which takes ATP and chops off two phosphates, creates cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP activates the protein kinase, and that moves the transporters into the plasma membrane. Another second messenger besides cyclic AMP is calcium. Calcium is going to be stimulated when gastrin from the G cells bind to the gastrin receptor in the parietal cell basal membrane. So calcium concentrations go up, activate protein kinase, and proton pumps go into the plasma membrane. Acetylcholine binding to its muscarinic receptor opens calcium channels, calcium concentrations go up, protein kinase is activated, proton pumps go into the plasma membrane. We've got these three links to the pumping of protons. Two via second messenger calcium, via the gastrin receptor and the acetylcholine receptor, and another one via the G protein link H2 receptor for histamine. You also need to turn things off. There's what your book doesn't mention is there are prostaglandin receptors on the basal surface of the parietal cell. Prostaglandin E2, EGB2, will stimulate that receptor, but it's an inhibitory receptor. What it does is decrease cyclic AMP concentrations in the cell. And that inhibits protein kinase. When protein kinase is inhibited, then these transporters come out. They're down-regulated from the apoplasma membrane. Another way to turn off the parietal cell is increase in hydrochloric acid concentration in the lumen. So HCO stimulates D cells. D cells release somatostatin. Somatostatin turns off parietal cells, ECL cells, and G cells. So three whammies with the somatostatin. Other things that turn off the parietal cell are CCK, secretin, and a hormone called gastric inhibitory peptide, GIP. in your book and we'll be talking more about it. So G I P. It also has another name because they discovered that it has another action. We'll say that. So to, to decrease action in the stomach, inhibit gastric activity, so it was named GIP. Okay, stomach uh, digestion, what's done there? Your textbook says amylase is still active. I put all these red question marks because I really doubt it's very active down here. has a pH optimum at, of 6.8. So unless it's hidden within all the other stuff that is in contact with the acid, it's not going to be active in the stomach. So maybe up in the storage area in the body of the stomach, um, fundus, if you're really eating a large meal, where you're not actively mixing it with the secretion, then amylase can still act. But once it's in contact with pH2, it's not going to be active anymore. So most of what's happening there is going to be protein digestion. And then they keep forgetting about that. We've got lingual lipase and gastric lipase, both present <laughs> in the stomach and both able to act on fats in the stomach. 
the nutrients, meaning amino acids, carbohydrates, monosaccharides, and fats. They're not absorbed from the stomach, but some things are. And alcohol is one of those things. And then some drugs, like aspirin, the acetosalicylic acid is absorbed from the stomach. So some things, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, like aspirin, they are absorbed from the stomach and they tend to cause problems in the stomach. And so does alcohol. If you have ulcers, you're not supposed to be drinking alcohol. If you have ulcers, you're not supposed to be using aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory products because that increases the, the problem with um, the ulcers. So pancreas, we've got pancreas that has two jobs in digestion. One is to release the digestive enzymes that will di further digest protein, fats, and carbohydrates. Also helps to neutralize the acid that's coming from the stomach in the, by secreting a lot of bicarbonate. And then it has an endocrine function as well. When the carbohydrates are absorbed, you've got to have them go somewhere. So insulin is being released even before the carbon, the, bonus, the glucose is absorbed into the bloodstream. The acinar cells secrete the digestive enzymes. The ducts that carry the digestive enzymes to the duodenum are the cells, are lined by the cells that will be secreting the bicarbonate. So it's called aqueous alkaline solution, but it's bicarb, that it's sodium bicarb that is going to neutralize the stomach acid. The duct cells are secrete, are, their secretions are stimulated by secretin, and the ACNR cells are stimulated by cholecystokinin. So you remember, and I, I posted a slide with the actual spelling out of pancreasinin. This same molecule has two names, cholecystokinin, which tells you it's involved with bile, but pancreasinin, which tells you it's related to secretions of enzymes from the pancreas. So that's the relationship to that ACE in our cell and uh, enzymes. So here's a picture, you've got your acinar cells here. They're secreting zymogen, so pancreozymin. So the zymogen secretions are your enzymes. The acinar cells secrete the digestive enzymes that are stored in the zymogen granules, and then the duct cells secrete the sodium bicarb. So your bicarb neutralizes the acid from the stomach, and then the digestive enzymes further break down fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. So sphincter of OD, I think physiologists tend to like that name because they tend to use it in their tests and sort of downplay the hepatopancreatic sphincter name. But those two are talking about the same sphincter here. And it's controlled whether the smooth muscle is relaxed or tight. It's controlled by CCK. So cholecystokinin, it's really going to be the only, um, well, it has the dominant effect on the sphincter. When CCK levels are high, smooth muscle relaxes. When CCK levels are low, smooth muscle constricts. There is probably some effect on secretin, uh, by secretin on this smooth muscle sphincter as well, but in normal healthy people, it's CCK that is dominant. But they found that in alcoholics, secretin has the upper hand. And so that um, is showing that secretin does have some effect. What 
does alcohol do to CCK levels that I don't know. But secretin is not the dominant relaxer of that sphincter. CCK is. But in alcoholics, CCK, something's happening to CCK's effect. And secretin has the upper hand. So what stimulates CCK, fat, and protein? And they usually are coming together. When you have proteins in animals, definitely you have fats in between the muscle cells of the animal protein. And in a lot of plant proteins, you also have the, animal, the um, um, plant oils that are present and fats. So fat and protein come together in most time, um, most ingestion of, of real food as opposed to things you buy at GNC. So CCK is going to go up with the presence of fat and protein in the duodenum. It goes into the blood. It has to come back to the organs via the blood. And then it comes back to the pancreas next door to the duodenum, stimulates the release of the enzymes from the acinar cells, and along with secretin, which is stimulating the bride, the duct cells from the pancreas, you get the two secretions coming on up. So sodium bicarb is there to neutralize the acid that came from the stomach, and the pancreatic secretions are there to digest protein and fat. There's also amylases that are coming out that will contribute to the carbohydrate digestion. Okay, take a break and then we're going to talk.